So here's what perplexes me, my advisor, Hachi Zhang, part of this work. Inspection is overwhelming. So here we have this website, this really cool UI effect, the iPad Mini. You can go on there and you can select your colors and everything. And as it changes, there's no page refresh happening. There's no flash, there's no silver light. This is native HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and it's really cool. But say I wanted to use this in my own website. What am I faced with? Similar problem. There's a lot of JavaScript, thousands of lines of JavaScript. And even as an intermediate programmer, I don't even know where to begin. I'm not sure what to do. And there are a lot of problems inherent with this approach. There's a lot of code. Entry points aren't obvious. There are tons of information barriers that prevent me from inspecting it. Changes happen so fast that I can't track them. And Co, Myers, and Ung tell us all about this with their paper on learning barriers. There's just a lot in the way of learners being able to learn something like this. So the broader research goal that I want to tackle with Unravel, I want to make examples out of professional websites everywhere. After all, websites are served out over the internet, and they give us the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in the browser. Why not reuse it and make sense of it? The problem is the code is so difficult. We have so much code at our fingertips, we just need the right tools to make sense of it for us. Before we dove into developing Unravel, we had a pilot study that examined what users do right now if they want to reverse engineer a web page and reuse part of it for their own work. So we took Tumblr. Tumblr won the Webby Awards this year for a really cool design. As you scroll down, you get this card flip effect and all these neat SVG animations that pop up. So we launched a pilot study and we asked four developers, intermediate and expert professional web developers, to reverse engineer Tumblr in 20 minutes. Think of that. Talk about anxiety. It's a little shaky. We, wanted to, we didn't want them to fully do it, but we wanted them to get enough out of it that they would head for a strategy of reverse engineering it and develop it for like their own web page to get a toy example going. Not all of them did it, but we did find some commonalities in their strategy. So there are 60,000 lines of unminified JavaScript in Tumblr. What they did is they copy and pasted a lot. They used command F to find all. They copied and, they copy and pasted the code, and, and there was really poor tool utilization, uh, inspecting with Chrome or inspecting with Safari, and, and looking for ways to get in and discover what the JavaScript was, such as like DOM breakpoints or inspecting event handlers. So with what Unravel, we, we found an idea. We want to unravel the mess of HTML and CSS and JavaScript for the user so that they can better understand it in learning examples. In doing that, we don't want to have inspection. We want to bubble up relevancy for the user so that they can discover what's happening. Offer some library detection for them so that they know, hey, jQuery's here. You might want to use it. Referencing related work, we really wanted to understand what had been done so far before diving in and developing our own approach. All of these approaches are, are wonderful. So back in 2009, Steve Oney and Brad Meyer's group launched Fire Crystal, and that helped us get record and replay in web applications. You could make a timeline, record a DOM interaction, play it back over time, and see what JavaScript was executed. Dynamic web breakpoints in 2010 with Barton at Mozilla gave us DOM breakpoints. You can actually set something on an HTML element and then when you change that HTML element, a breakpoint is dynamically set in JavaScript. It's really cool stuff, and not many people know about it. Theseus, in 2014, gave us real-time event traces from the browser through live instrumentation. As you're doing something in the browser, you can see it in context with your IDE brackets in this case. Live traces happening, you can make sense of them there. And we just heard about Scry giving us replay and a hint of causal JS, HTML, CSS, as well as disk between program states. So how does Unravel fit into this work? And I'll add my own vastly minified line of description here. I just want, show me what happens first, and let me inspect it later. Just give me a high-level idea of what code is causing it, just the small portion of code, and let me inspect it. I want to make Unravel portable so that it's not tied to one browser. You can implement it in multiple browsers, make it native HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to inspect native HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I want the technical parts of it to be extendable so that if you want to key in on that JavaScript inspection, why not be able to implement that in Node.js or Rhino.js or other JavaScript runtime environments? And lastly, I really want to evaluate how it's used with a user study. 
Because after all, we're targeting users, we're making things easy for them, we want to target learners, and we need to understand how they're using it, what, it, what they're doing, and if it's useful. So Unravel as a system, and I'll zoom in a little bit later in case you can't see it, composed of three panes, and it's an extension of the Chrome DevTools. It lives in the Chrome DevTools, and it's out on the side. So on the left here, we have Tumblr, and on the right, we have this inspection pane called Unravel. At the top part, you have HTML observations happening. This top pane shows you everything that's rolling up and changing on the page as it happens during your recording. The middle pane is library detection. Tell me what libraries are available there. A lot of people developing JavaScript are using libraries to save them a lot of time with syntactic sugar and polyfills and things like that. JavaScript traces is the last pane on the bottom. What that does is it highlights call stacks that are made to the document API. And the document API is where the magic happens for changing the HTML. And that's all of what I wanted to capture for these rich contextualized UI interactions. All right, let's do a live demo. We'll go over here, I'm in the browser. I have Tumblr up. And this is the cool card flip effect that happens. You scroll down and you get that cool interaction. So I have Unravel over here on the right. It injects an observation agent into the page. And what it does is this, is, this is a web page in an extension listening for events from the agent within the web page. I hit record and I recreate the interaction. I get a ton of events that pop up and now I can go, I stop the recording, I can zoom in and I can see what happened. So first in our HTML changes pane, I have an affordance selected to hide SVG. There are a lot of SVG animations and I didn't want them to distract me from that card flip effect. Right here, I see that there are two changes on the HTML, two changes, and these are all X paths leading to the selectors that happen. I have selectors built up to show me what was changed as a CSS selector, and then I can look into attribute changes that happened over time, such as the class show login was here, and now the class show login is gone. So I have a small hint as to what's happening. As I scroll down to the pane, I can see that Tumblr's running jQuery, Backbone, and Lodash with different versions. So I know to look for things like dollar signs, underscores, and the word Backbone, which is kind of funny. But it helps me understand what's going on in the code. Perhaps the most useful feature out of our user study was this JavaScript function calls pane. This tells us what was made to the document API during our recording. We have 22 calls to this one stack frame that executed. All of those calls resulted in document API calls that we monitored. So we can just click on one of these for inspection, come in here, and out of the 60,000 line, lines of code, it brought us to this function called show slide, which if you look at it, tells us that we just do some opacity change, we animate, we cause a delay. And if I'm wondering how Tumblr did this and I want to do it on my own site, I can even copy paste this and use it, remix it a little bit, and integrate it with my own site. That concludes the live demo. Now I'll tell you, how does it work? So the core technical contribution of this paper is the API harness. And previously I told you that JavaScript manipulates the document API to change the page. What the API harness does is it wraps all of those functions on the document API and it monitors them. It's installed during runtime and it's related to Scotty, um, which Agen and others did in 2011. Scotty, in other words, could help you implement something like an API harness. Since this is WIST, I'll show you some pseudocode. So for each function in window.document, we're going to closure off that, that base function, save it for later, create a new function in its place that captures the arguments or call to the function. And since we're inspecting with JavaScript, we don't have access, we don't want to have dependencies on a debugger. So we're just going to throw and catch an error to get a call stack of what happened so we can link it later to an inspector. Publish those to a listener and then actually call the document API that queried the document. Th this happens so we can implement it, get out of the way and have a low overhead for the JavaScript execution thread. So how did Unravel work with our users? Over here on the right we have some videos of users in our user study trying to reverse engineer sites with and without Unravel. We did it on Flickr, Kickstarter, iPad, Tumblr and Amazon. 13 junior and senior web developers. These weren't really students, these were more like expert developers that we did it with. We wanted them to be familiar with Chrome DevTools already so that we could use that as a baseline in the study. Research questions we addressed were, how did this alter their strategy? What was the utilization like? 
and what barriers were overcome. We gave them 15 minutes to reverse engineer one site and then 15 minutes to reverse engineer another site, mixing up the controls for a within subjects design, and then 15 minutes for follow-up. And we tracked milestones, three milestones, find one critical source for the functionality, find a second critical source for the functionality. Keep in mind, we reverse engineered all of these ahead of time. And the milestone three, when the user communicated, they have the aha moment. I really get how this website is doing this interaction. So we tracked all those over time, and we found a 53.4% decrease in time to milestone one. Not really a huge or noticeably decrease in the, other, in, in the other milestones. And this told us that Unravel is good at helping users find an entry point into the application and understanding where they can start. But after that, the existing tools are pretty good at helping them along. Users look through a lot less JavaScript. They use the JavaScript traces the most. And seven out of 13 people learn something new, which was kind of exciting. So we'll skip the discussion a little bit. I kind of went over that. Uh, the limitations. Uh, this is only the client side of the story, undoubtedly. We don't know what's happening on the application side of the server. We don't have that. It's black box for us. Unravel doesn't deal with SVG animation well. WebGL, it just can't capture those. Closured off document API references aren't really going to be exposed if you closure those off. And then minification does leave some variables a mystery. However, this can have an unforeseen benefit because some people are honestly really bad at naming variables. So sometimes it's more fun to have var a equals foo bar. <laughs> and it was only tested on a small number of users. So we'd like to see a lot more developed study assessing its limitations. So I could tell you about future work or I could just show you it. So here's where the work is headed. And I recorded this. So in JavaScript, we have a basic interaction. In JavaScript, you can do a show hide on Tumblr to show and hide a slide and make it go up and down. Or we can just do something simple in a toy example here. On the top left is a button where we can just show and hide a circle. So we're going to hit record in the interface. We're going to show and hide the circle using JavaScript on the fly. After that recording happens, we're going to click one button that just says fiddle. And we'll see what happens. So on the fly, that extracted source out of the web page and put it out on the internet in a live editor that can be shared, forked, and redistributed. The interaction is reproducible in this editor, as well as the JavaScript, HTML, and CSS are available for us. Code that was run was highlighted in yellow. This is based off of thesis and fondue. And we have call stacks and arguments aggregated in line with what happened. There are also affordances to hide inactive code, hide libraries so that we can get to the essence of what was executed in these shareable examples. So that's where the work is headed. So with that, I'd like to expand the challenge to all of you to join with me to help make the internet a world of professional examples. Thank you so much. start. So Tumblr is a really interesting example because they won the Webby Award because they were creating a novel interaction, something that was essentially created bespoke. It had, didn't exist before. They, and usually when you do that, you end up sort of hacking the existing libraries to make it work. And eventually that becomes the norm and people wrap it into functions and then figure out how to implement it. But I wonder if, if your goal is really these, these very novel or maybe in some cases esoteric interactions, they're, they're inevitably going to come bundled with a lot of code. They're not going to be very straightforward for some novice to come in and inspect and understand. So I wonder if that's the direction you want to go, is there like another level of indirection that we need to, that we need to pop up and in order to explain at a high level what's going on? Because if you just look at the low level JavaScript, it's going to be tough. Yes, yes, absolutely. And the question was, how can I you know, this is going to be confusing for novices if we have all these odd, crazy interactions that are, that are program really difficult. And as part of the future work, this is originally catered towards intermediate and advanced users. But we really want to step back and access learn, learning pathways that lead up to those advanced interactions. So once we get all that code out, let's use some means to, de to develop, hey, you need to know the fundamentals of JavaScript, you need to know jQuery, and then you might want to look at an advanced API like jQuery Animate to discover how to understand this code. Develop that in concert with that example and ship it as a readily available learning experience on the fly. Thank you for that question. 
Uh, Lydia Chilton from the University of Washington. Um, so this is, this is great work. I do a lot of web um, programming. It's kind of all I do. And yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> I love your story about creating, uh, what do you call it, real world teachable examples? Yeah. Was that the right? Sure. Yeah. So um, one thing that you realize is that you see an element and then you have no idea how complicated it is. Um, and then uh, sort of in your uh, scheme, you have various levels of things that are interacting. Is there a way to maybe give someone a score to say, hey, this is going to be hard, or hey, this is going to be easy before I decide <laughs> that I really want to learn it? Yeah, um, and that's, that's also a great consideration. And some aspects we're looking to, into are like behavior mining, in essence. So like I can gather all these examples, I can see commonalities in them, and I can rank them amongst each other. And I hadn't considered like a difficulty rating yet, but I like that consideration. I think it would be pretty useful. In tandem, like with the earlier point about let's, let's make learning examples out of these for novices and scaffold them along that learning pathway mm -hmm. and say, hey, this is more of an advanced tutorial. You know, if, if you want to stick around for a while, you can actually learn all this rather than just an intro simple tutorial. Yeah, I like that a lot. Thank you.